Today, we're going to talk about some really interesting information relating to an autoimmune disease. Now, if you have an autoimmune condition, uh, this video is going to enlighten you on a, a protocol that you may or may not know about. This information is about the Coimbra uh, protocol by Dr. Coimbra. He's a Brazilian neurologist. This is what he said. All or nearly all patients with autoimmune disease have an increased resistance to the effects of vitamin D. Now we know today there are thousands of scientific peer review studies linking the vitamin D levels to autoimmune diseases. So in other words, if you have autoimmune disease, chances are you're low in vitamin D. But Dr. Kohimbra uh, took it one step further and found out that there's not just a deficiency of vitamin D, there's a resistance to vitamin D. He noticed that in order to raise the vitamin D levels in these patients with autoimmune diseases, it requires much higher doses than in the average population. So for example, if you're going to maintain vitamin D levels in a healthy person, uh, you'd probably want to use 10,000 IUs. And this is also based on quite a few uh, credible sources, like Dr. Michael Hallock, who's the authority in vitamin D, discusses taking 10,000 IUs of vitamin D without any chance of toxicity, versus the medical healthcare system in general recommending only 600 IUs of vitamin D per day. So when you give a patient who has an autoimmune disease 10,000 IUs of vitamin D3, you may notice only a slight partial improvement. So this topic is very, very important, especially since like 50 million people in the US have autoimmune conditions. Now, vitamin D is not really a vitamin. It's a hormone. Its chemistry is very similar to steroid hormones, okay? That's why it creates some very similar effects to cortisol. It's a very powerful anti-inflammatory. It helps to um, calm down an overactive immune system because one of its amazing functions is its ability to act as an immune regulator, okay? So it regulates the immune system. So if your immune system is attacking itself, that's out of control. And that's what an autoimmune condition is, whether you have MS, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's, Hashimoto's, or whatever. What's common in all those conditions is number one, inflammation and a low vitamin D status. But my question is, since there's so much data on this relationship between low vitamin D levels and autoimmune disease, why don't the doctors recommend this more often? Well, I'm gonna refer you to vitamin C in scurvy. Now in 1595, the world faced a serious problem with sailing ships. Sailors were dying, there was no cause, no cure. Then in 1601, okay, several years later, you have Captain James Lancaster decided to give one teaspoon of lemon juice daily to a certain group of sailors. And all of those sailors did not die, but a good percentage of those who didn't take it died like 40%. So it was known back in 1595 that something in lemon juice prevented scurvy, which is a very serious, deadly condition. Then in 1753, James Lind published a study on scurvy, and he concluded a sudden and visible effect for scurvy when you fed these sailors oranges and lemons. Now, you would think that this, this would be disseminated and people would accept it and the medical profession would welcome this great information, right? <laughs> Not quite. In fact, even James Lib himself said that it wasn't the vitamin C primarily, that was a secondary effect. He said that uh, scurvy was caused by moisture and you had to keep these sailors uh, in a dry environment. Then in 1795, Gilbert Bain persuaded the Royal Navy to give lemon juice to sailors. But it took 70 years later in 1865 before the intake of lemon was finally recommended to prevent scurvy. But even that didn't convince everyone. So it was soon discredited for about, you know, 60 more years until they actually discovered vitamin C. So vitamin C was discovered in 1932. Now, even during the Civil War, which is 1861 through 1865, 
7,000 Union troops died of scurvy. Another 45,000 troops died indirectly of scurvy from dysentery, which is an infection that affects the digestive system, as well as diarrhea. I mean, in 1849, when they had the California gold rush, 10,000 people died. And then the Irish famine with the potato crops in 1840s, over a million people died of scurvy. So what is my point? My point is it takes a long time for the medical profession to adopt new ideas. So with this whole vitamin D deficiency linked to autoimmune disease, it, it could take, you know, probably another 150 to, I don't know, 200 years before they really fully accept this. And then you have in the meantime, people that will, will stick to this conventional wisdom, um, even though uh, there's so many side effects because the treatment for autoimmune disease is mainly steroids and steroids give some massive, massive side effects and vitamin D does not. And vitamin D works very similar to the steroid cortisol, but without the side effect. Now, when you're using higher doses of vitamin D, um, potentially you could get hypercalcemia. And the biggest problem with that is kidney stones. However, when we talk about the protocol next, Dr. Kohimbra came up with a solution for this potential side effect. But what we have to realize is that it takes high, high doses of vitamin D over months to create hypercalcemia. So vitamin D is not really a vitamin. It's a hormone. It acts like a steroid. It doesn't have the side effects, but it is different than most hormones because hormones have a, a very specific target the tissue they go after. Okay. Like for example, the hormone testosterone or cortisol or other hormones, or even estrogen, they go after very specific tissues, but with vitamin D, which I don't even like to call it a vitamin, its receptor, its target is in every single cell of the body. You have 229 different genes that are directly influenced by vitamin D, which relate to 25,000 different functions. It is the most important vitamin simply because it does so many different things and so many people are deficient in this vitamin. Now, this is all very interesting, but there's something even more interesting that I wanna share with you right now. Remember I mentioned the term resistant, right? You're resistant to vitamin D. One big way someone is resistant to vitamin D is a problem with the vitamin D receptor, okay? And that condition is called vitamin D polymorphism which is an alteration in the receptor for vitamin D. So in other words, if someone has this defect in the receptor, uh, they're gonna be very resistant to absorbing vitamin D. They're gonna have to take a lot more than a person who doesn't have this problem. So to make this simple to understand, um, you can look at a polymorphism as a mutation, which is some change in the genetics. Now, this is very interesting, okay? You can develop a polymorphic change or a mutation in the gene, either through having it inherited from your parents or developing it this life from the environment spontaneously. A drug, a severe overwhelming stress, which could explain why so many people develop autoimmune diseases after a severe loss of a loved one, or a severe stress event or a trauma. So the more resistant you are to vitamin D, the more predisposed you are to getting an autoimmune disease, like diabetes, type one and type two, cancer, bone loss, and even hives. Not to mention all the other factors that cause resistance to vitamin D, like the color of your skin, the darker your skin, the, the more difficult it is to absorb vitamin D because the pigment melanin blocks the UV radiation, which is kind of necessary for the formation of vitamin D through the skin. Then you have like the metabolic syndrome or insulin resistance factor, which can block your ability to absorb vitamin D. Um, obesity, the more fat you have, the less you're gonna absorb vitamin D. Then you have age, the older you are, the less you're gonna absorb vitamin D. And then of course we have the diet, which is even more difficult to get vitamin D from the diet because there's not many foods that will give it to you unless you're consuming uh, fatty fish, salmon, cod liver oil, things like that. And then on top of everything else, 
just not getting exposure to sun. People stay inside all the time. They don't get out there to get that sun. Not to mention if they do, they put a bunch of sun lotion on, on their body to prevent the UV radiation. All right, so all that is very interesting, but what is the protocol? That's what I'm gonna cover right now. Now, when doing this protocol, um, it'd be important to find a doctor that can work with you. And I'm gonna show, explain why in a second. Um, I'm gonna put a link down below of a website that you can help locate a doctor that can work with you that knows this protocol. Because you're gonna do a test for vitamin D before you start, but you're not gonna determine the dosage of vitamin D by your vitamin D levels. Why? Because you have this resistance, remember? So you're gonna determine the dosage by measuring something else. And that's called the parathyroid hormone or what's called parathormone. When you take vitamin D, that suppresses the parathyroid hormone. So the more vitamin D you take that gets absorbed, the less parathyroid hormone you're gonna have. So the goal with this whole protocol is to drop your parathyroid hormone into the lower level of the normal range. Now, if your parathyroid hormone is high, that usually means that you're low in vitamin D or it's being resistant, it's just not going in. Now, as far as the amount of vitamin D that someone is gonna take, it could range anywhere between 40,000 IUs per day to 200,000 IUs per day, depending on a couple factors, one being your body weight, as well as the parathyroid hormone. So typically the rough uh, formula for how much vitamin D you're gonna start with would be a thousand IUs per kilogram of body weight. So I weigh 185 pounds. So that means I weigh about roughly 84 kilograms, which would equate to about 84,000 IUs of vitamin D per day. Now to minimize the main side effect, of this protocol, okay, which is kidney stones, what he recommends is avoiding calcium, okay, as a supplement, as in hard water, okay, as in nuts, because nuts have a good amount of calcium, like in tofu or other soy products, which do have calcium, and anything related to dairy, like milk, cheese, yogurt, etc. And on top of that, you'll drink about two and a half liters of fluid a day. So you can have the benefits of vitamin D without the, um, the one big side effect, which is kidney stones. And typically he states that it takes roughly about two months to see the changes in the blood consistently. But then over the course of two years, you'd be checking the parathyroid about four times and making adjustments throughout. And then within two years, once you're stabilized, then you'll be on a maintenance type program. Now, again, this might sound complex or difficult, et cetera, but from my point of view, if you have an autoimmune disease and you wanna weigh out the risks and the benefits of being on prednisone long-term versus doing this, I think it's a no-brainer. So again, I put the information down below. You can click the link. I'm not affiliated with this doctor in any way, shape or form, but it's great information for someone that is looking for an alternative to the conventional treatment for autoimmune disease. Now, if you haven't seen my video on vitamin D toxicity, I put that up right here, check it out.